Welcome on in, everybody. It's your boy, GS Luke. Monday morning, ready to break down the golf course for this week, as we always do. And uh, better vibes than usual, because uh, our Pittsburgh Steelers took down the Saints yesterday. You know, one of the only bright spots we've had this entire year. But anytime we're here on a Monday, I'm excited to get into next week, particularly after a successful venture the week before. We had plenty of members of the community takedown contest including the 20 max, big 20 max contest. We had a GPP winner, a few guys that took down some single entries, a bunch of just caches across the board. So you love to see that. A profitable week for myself too. And really looking forward to getting into the RSM Classic, which is what we've got for this week's event. If tilling with two golf courses, which is a, a little bit different than what we're used to seeing, you have the Seaside and the Plantation course. They'll be on Seaside for three out of the four days and then Plantation will be mixed in there for one round Thursday or Friday for players. So adds a little bit of complexity to our analysis as we have to focus on both tracks, but they play similar. We don't really have to break them down by each golf course. So we'll talk about all of those implications, but, uh, you know, we're going to try and make this as quick as humanly possible, right? So let's go ahead and get right on into this thing. The quote unquote main course this week is going to be the seaside course. It is a par 70, just over 7,000 yards in terms of length, but played closer to 6,800 yards in a Tom Fazio redesign in 1999. Now it first came into construction in the early, or I should say late 1920s, um, early 1930s is when it really opened up to the public and it's changed a whole lot over the years. But most notably after Fazio came here in 1999, it plays as a link style golf course along the seaside. Um, it's not a true links though, not like what you see at a Pebble Beach, which is kind of a little bit closer to a links than what you'd see. Um, and certainly not what you'd see overseas um, in Europe, UK, Scotland, those sort of golf courses. Um, it's got the seaside nature to it. It's got the heavy winds. You can play it along the ground if you'd like to, but it's not nearly as contoured as most link style golf courses. In the greens, though they play faster than a lot of the other coastal tracks like a Mayakoba, a Port Royal golf course for that. That matter. Um, the greens run a little bit faster around the seaside course. Um, they're not running at a true links speed, right? Like 13s or 12 and a halfs on the stint meter. Um, they'll be at 11 and a half to 12s on the stint meter this week. But the scoring average played under par. I mean, if the winds aren't blowing, this place is going to be gettable at just over 7,000 yards. Last year, it played 1.03 shots under par, which was 68.97 shots. For this par 70 setup in terms of water hazards um there is a lot of trouble in play we'll say that uh, but you do have relatively large landing areas but water is in play on 14 of 18 holes and there are 47 sand bunkers so you know if you're a little bit offline you are going to be penalized so that's one thing we'll talk about when we get to the key stats um, and some of the other key features of the golf course in terms of penalty strokes per round, because of all of those hazards, you did see 0.42 strokes per round um, being added to player scorecards, which is only 0.01 more than the average. So despite there being water in play on almost every single hole, right, only four holes without water, um, 47 bunkers, which is nearly three times as many as what we had for last week, um, only 0.42 strokes per round, which uh, shows you how large the landing areas are. Again, we'll get to that right now. So the fairways. 42 yards wide among the widest that you have on the PGA Tour schedule. This is supposed to be a resort style course. In fact, part of the Sea Island Resort there where plenty of tourists come to play golf, not necessarily PGA Tour pros. You're going to hear all week from every single content creator, including myself, when we get to player breakdowns and some of the videos about the Sea Island Mafia, the players that are local residents to Sea Island or even the players that just train in Sea Island because there's plenty of them that maybe don't live on St. Simon's Island but live in Brunswick, other areas of Georgia or neighboring states like a Florida that come to you know St. Simon's Island to train all the time. So there's plenty of guys that have familiarity here, uh, but you're dealing with massively wide fairways that are super easy to hit. And this is a strategy putting based golf course so we'll talk about the fairways they're extremely wide they're hit at a 73.6 percent clip which is a whole 7.7 percent higher than your average they are a tiffway bermuda plus a platinum pespalum so a little bit of a hybrid surface there um, the pespalum is the minority grass type though it is mostly a tiffway bermuda 
The rough is two inches tiff way Bermuda, um, so similar to the fairways there. And it had a missed fairway penalty of 0.37 shots, which was exactly at your tour average. So a two inch Bermuda grass, that's what we're used to seeing on the PGA Tour. And uh, the rough that we have here fits that description perfectly. Um, it played right to the tour average. So uh, nothing really of note there. In terms of the green size, they are just as large as the fairways. They are 7,200 square, um, sorry, 7,200 square foot per green on average, um, which is a healthy 1,000 square foot higher than what we're used to seeing. A Tiff Eagle Bermuda grass that run at right around a 12 to 12 and a half on the stint meter and raise throughout the weekend. The GIR percentage last year was 75.6%, which was a healthy 7.4% higher than the tour average. So, your fairways hit 7.7% more than usual. Your greens hit 7.4% than usual. So, you know, usually when we're looking at a golf course and we see that the ball striking is easier than most weeks, that would put this in a putting contest. And that is especially the case when both metrics are well above the tour average there. And you see the scoring average is just one under par. That leaves the difficulty on the greens. We had a similar situation for Memorial Park. If you remember in 2021, where it played slightly more difficult than what we saw this year, you had averages that were slightly below average in terms of your fairway percentage uh, your GAR percentage was way through the roof, right? Plenty of greens were hit around there, or at least it was right about tour average there at Memorial Park, yet the scoring average was much more difficult than what we're used to seeing. That kind of disconnect is due to the complexity of the greens. And then around the seaside course, I have to say, you know, since the redesign in 1999, that was where a majority of the changes were made. I mean, they tried to make it a little bit more beautiful, a little bit more accommodating for the resort style guests, um, just kind of leveling up the golf course in general. But they also made the greens a lot more difficult. So despite this being a resort style course, the greens are a little bit more penal than you'd see at a lot of the resort style courses like a Puerto Rico Open, Mayakoba Championship, like with El Camillon, for example. Um, so you definitely have to keep that in mind. There is going to be quite a bit of separation on the greens as a result, um, as the better putters tend to get the job done um, on the more complex surfaces. Alrighty, because we got two courses to go through, this is going to be an especially quick hole-by-hole -hole breakdown. So first off, we got hole number one, 419 yards, a dogleg from right to left. And you can see right off the bat the identity of this track. It's got a really tight landing area, the more aggressive you are off the tee. And even with just a driving iron or maybe a three wood for some of the shorter hitters on tour, you're going to be dealing with let's say 20 to 25 yards of room, you're going to see a lot of players really lay up off the tee here. I'm expecting some six irons, maybe some four or five irons at the very most off the tee to try and take it a little bit further back. So this is where that strategy component comes in. So again, we're going to try and go through this a little bit more quickly here, but you're going to see a lot of players laying up off the tee. So when we're looking at the driving accuracy stats, I think we might want to pull them from similar short positional tracks, like a Harbor Town Golf Links, for example, um, Sedgefield Country Club, which, you know, I don't want to give away too much right now. We're going to talk about those tracks plenty when we get to the comp courses section. Next up, we got hole number two. It is 397, a little bit more wide open off the tee. You know, we talked about the wide fairways before. They were 42 yards wide. Um, this is an example of that, right? This is closer to like 35, maybe 30 yards wide in terms of a landing area. A lot of players will also lay up off the tee here. If you decide to take a driver, I mean, I guess you could get it to the corner here, but you're not going to really reach the surface. I mean, it would just be irresponsible. I mean, typically you got quite a bit of wind in your face on hole number two as well. So a lot of players will take that conservative approach, just try and avoid that bunker to the left and leave themselves a probably a degreed wedge in, at the very most, a pitching wedge into the wind to a, I don't the pin location can make a huge difference on hole number two. I will say that you can see a shaved off area to the back left of the green, um, which makes those pin locations a little bit tricky. If you go ahead and tuck it towards there, um, over the bunker isn't so bad because you have a backstop supporting you there. So there can be extremely accessible pin locations. Uh, then the trickier ones are towards the back of the green. Hole three is 214 yards. It's a relatively long par three, um, but it's, you know, as straightforward as you're going to get. 
It's got one bunker protecting it in the front, shaved off areas all around the green, which you'll see at every single Lynx style course. So this isn't a true Lynx. I alluded to that a little bit before, but you get some of those characteristics. So that's why I like to point it out. That's why a few people will comp this to a Pebble Beach Golf Lynx, um, because like this course, it's not a true Lynx style, but it has some of those characteristics. And uh, that's something I wanted to point out with hole number three. Hole four is a huge dog leg from right to left. Um, off the tee, you're definitely laying up. There's no point at trying to carry it over the corner here. You will see a few players, if it's downwind, um, be a little bit of a daredevil and take it on. You can see it's only, what is it, like a 315-yard carry. So if you have a tailwind, it's not that crazy of a prospect. But, I mean, you're hitting a 90-yard approach shot. Um, if you're being really crazy, right, you can get it to like a 70-yard approach shot over there. Um, as opposed to, what, like 120, 130 yards? Um, 140 is probably where most players are going to lay up to here. That's still a pitching wedge, a 9-iron at the very most for these guys. Uh, I just don't see how much you gain right, from going up there to a field wedge shot as opposed to a full shot where these players are used to hitting it to 15 to 20 feet all day. Hole 5 is 4'11". Um, it's a dogleg from left to right, so complete opposite of what you've seen over the last few holes. Um, so that's one thing around the seaside course is you have to have both ball flights. Uh, you can't be somebody that just relies on a right to left shot or a left to right shot. Um, you like, you know, just get it in the fairway. Again, this is going to be the entire recipe here. Get it in the fairway, you leave yourself a wedge shot. 150 yards in. Hole six is a shorter par three. Um, also plays slightly downhill, um, but and just like the last par three, has one bunker protecting it in the front, shaved areas all around. Uh, you're just running the bill, Lynx style par three. Hole seven is your first par five. 576 yards, um, does not dogleg in either direction. Uh, what I want to point out here are the penalties off the tee. Now I've kind of avoided that for the most part because over those first four of the five holes uh, there's not as many hazards in play but if you're missing here let's say by five to ten yards you're going to be okay you have little rough patches they're not a ton of trees to worry about i mean even on the right you have some rough that's going to catch you before getting into the water but if you hit it in the, into the water you're going to be in a world of trouble you hit it into the marsh over here to the left you're in a heap of trouble just like the right side um so there are penalty strokes to be had in blow up holes to be had around the seaside course. It's just that you have to get really far offline to get there. So, you know, as long as you're relatively controlled off the tee, you have your misses um, within the bounds of play, uh, you should be good to go. And this should be a birdie look, most likely reachable in two for the entire field. Hole eight is 373 yards. Uh, this one you can be a little bit more aggressive on. So I know some of the other short, shorter par threes, um, I've told players to maybe be a little bit hesitant. Uh, this fairway bunker to the right is right in the layup zone, right? This is 260. This is where a lot of players are going to carry their driving irons to. So if you take a three wood, you can most likely take it out of play. I mean, 283, most players have that in the bag for their three wood. But if you hit a driver, you know you can take it out of play. The unfortunate part is, is then you bring in the natural areas to the left side of the green into play. So it's an interesting hole, depending on your carry distance with your three wood. Uh, I mean, if you're somebody that can carry a three wood 285, 290, this is a perfect hole for you to hit that. But if it's, you know, it's something that's carrying 280 for you, right, where you're just hardly going to get over the bunker, then maybe you want to hit driver. But then, you know, you've got the issues with the other sandy area. So it's 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 a hole where you hopefully have that length with the three wood. If you don't, uh, you have an interesting decision to be made. Hole nine is 456. Uh, another hole where you can't miss to the right. I mean, if you do so, you're going to be in the water. If you miss to the left, you're in this fairway bunker, which is, you know, a lot better than being in the water hazard. Uh, but another gettable hole, this would be classified as a difficult hole at Sea Island. Uh, but you can see it's still nothing like a bear. It's not 500 yards. It's not 533 like we saw there at Memorial Park. Hole 10 is 418. Um, a handshake just like hole number one, but you can't fall asleep on the tee shot. You do have a heavily wooded area to the left, a natural area to the right where it's not a given penalty shot, but there are a few bushes, fescue patches in there uh, that will have you taking a uh, relief shot. But if you can get in the fairway with an iron, you know, it's 283 is where we have the marker here. That's a driving iron for most players. You've got yourself a pitching wedge in. 11 is 423. Uh, this tee shot, I mean, look at it from the tee. It's a little bit daunting with how many sandy areas you have. 
but it's a positional tee shot. Most players are going to hit three wood here, and look at how wide the three wood landing area is. I mean, it's a solid 50, 60 yards wide right here. I mean, the overhead look doesn't give it quite as much justice as you'd expect, but on average, again, it's a 42 yard wide fairway um, across all 14 fairways. Uh, so it's it's not that difficult to hit out there, particularly if you're laying up with something less than driver. Hole 12 is 222, so a longer par 3, no bunker, actually I should say, there's a bunker to the right side of the green, uh, no bunker in front of the green this time because of that added length, uh, and once again, the shaved off areas around the green. Hole 13 is 409, slight dogleg from the right to the left. Um, you Another fairway shot, you just have to hit the short stuff. I mean, you miss to the left, you're in the water. You miss to the right, you're in sand the whole way down there. So driving accuracy, you can probably already tell, going to be a huge key stat for the seaside course. Um, it's something that we're going to have to focus on. Hole 14 is 448. Um, extremely wide fairway. I mean, about 60, 65 yards wide. Um, especially if you're hitting a three wood, it's almost impossible to miss. And yet again, at most a nine, maybe an eight iron into the screen. Hole 15 is 564, your last par five. It one where the longer you are, the shorter you can make it because this sandy patch to the left can be carried. Um, this is set at a 290 yard drive. We know that most tour players can at least probably get it out here to 300 yard carry. Um, if not some of the longer players really being a little bit crazy here and maybe trying to take this bunker out of play. So let's see how, how big of a carry. It's 339 to get it over that. I mean, that's asking a little bit much, but you know, if you're a little bit more conservative, just aim out to the right. 307 gets you to the dead center right here with right about 230 into this surface. So you're gonna see plenty of eagle looks, uh, particularly for some of those longer players. Hole 16 is 404. Uh, another dogleg from right to left where you can cut off, you know, the more and more that you wanna take it over the water there. A lot of players are gonna be conservative, take it with an iron off the tee to the right. Um, that's where this marker is indicating. But again, if you wanna be crazy, right, set up a little flip wedge into the green, be aggressive, take it down the left. 307 carry gets you to this spot right here. And with right around an 80, 90 yard wedge shot into the green. Hole 17 is 193. It's your last par three. Um, two bunkers this time on this par three, but uh, your same exact setup. And that's the one you know gripe I have with this golf course, if you can't tell. It's just the cookie cutter mentality that they have with these par threes. Uh, they all look the same. They all play the same too. It's just a little bit unfortunate. Hole 18 is 472, so the longest par four on property. Um, but it, look how wide this fairway is. It's almost comical. It's, I believe the third widest fairway in all of the PJ Tour, actually might be second. I know the one in Harbor Town is uh, the widest fairway in all the PJ Tour. I know it uh, over there for the Tournament of Champions, Kapalua, they have one that's a little bit wider too. So I think it's number three on the PJ Tour, um, but still a lengthy shot into the green. So you can't fall asleep. You do have a shaved off area over the back right that's tricky. Um, the Sunday pin location, I believe, is in the back left here. So this runoff area, the bunker to the left comes into play. Uh, you just can't fall asleep, right? I know the rest of the golf course, you can go on autopilot, just hit three woods off the tee, um, very, you know, wedges or eight, nine irons into every single green. Uh, you're going to have to hit, probably hit like a seven iron here, which again, like, oh, I got to hit a seven iron for these tour players. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the one hole that you can't fall asleep on. All right, we spent a little bit more time on the seaside course as it is the main course this week, right, for three out of the four rounds. But the plantation course will give its due diligence. In terms of a pro visualizer breakdown, I would do it for the plantation, but uh, if you go on it, holes like 14 through 18 are a scrambled mess. You have players teeing off from the green, um, teeing off from the middle of the woods, that sort of thing. So uh, clearly they're a little bit off on that end. So not gonna use the pro visualizer tool, but uh, still we have quite a bit of information about the track. It's a par 72, just over 7,000 yards, a Davis Love the Third redesign in back in 2019, and it plays a little bit differently than what you have for the Seaside course. You know, on top of the designer changes, it has a little bit more of a risk-reward type of identity. There's drivable par fours. You have four reachable par fives, all easily reachable by the entire field. And you can have players that have six plus eagle looks by the end of the day. And now players aren't all that likely to convert on them because the greens are extremely difficult around the plantation course. But you're going to have plenty of guys that take it to eight, nine under par. I mean, Mackenzie Hughes, Patrick 
Patrick Rogers over the years. Plenty of the champions like a Taylor Gooch have taken this place nuclear low on a Thursday or a Friday. And in fact, that's been a huge reason for their success because outside of that, you know, the Seaside course can play under par, but you're not going to see a lot of those nuclear rounds of 10 under par like you had Sebastian Munoz do. I mean, last year, his 60 in play was one of the lowest rounds you'll see around the Seaside course. Um, you will get rounds like Grayson Sig, who shot a 58 around the Seaside course, um, but again, not very often under tournament conditions. But this course, Risk Reward, has water in play on 10 of 18 holes, so a little bit less than the other track, but it has 81 sand bunkers, so an unbelievable amount of sand in play, um, especially when you compare it to the 19 sand bunkers they had at Memorial Park last week, uh, just eye-opening stuff. The fairways are e extremely, unbelievably wide. Uh, we don't have an exact measurement on them, but they're almost twice as wide on average as the ones at Seaside, at least from the overhead views. Uh, that's the sort of information that I could at least estimate. Um, and we already have 42 yard wide fairways. So we're looking at just the widest fairways I think we see on average on all the PGA Tour. And though you don't have any that are like 150 yards wide, almost every single one is at least 65 to 70 yards wide. So um, you're going to see a ton of fairways hit. They are a platinum pus pollen grass, so also a little bit different than what you had on the seaside side. The rough is one and a half inches, so slightly shorter, and is a tiff tough Bermuda. The greens also a little bit smaller, so despite having massive fairways, um, the greens are a little bit smaller here at Plantation, just 6,100 square foot per green, and they are a tiff eagle Bermuda, very similar to the seaside side. And uh, what I'll talk about, kind of like what we had learned over the hole by hole breakdown, is that you have these drivable par fours where the longer you are off the tee, the more distance you can bite off of dog legs, the more bunkers that you can take off of play, and then just massive landing areas. So players that are extremely long off the tee are going to be able to utilize that distance whereas players that are a little bit more accurate can still score because you're going to put wedge in play you know from 150 yards rather than you know something like 50 to 60 yards so uh there's multiple ways to take apart this golf course it's why we've seen like a patrick rogers go out there and shoot a super low score um he does it with that bomb and gouge strategy more of like around the green right those 50 60 yard little flip shots whereas a taylor gooch though he's you know relatively long off the tee he took the more calculated approach right laying up off the tee hitting a lot of three woods hitting wedges into the green to five to ten feet and then just cashing in the one defense of the plantation course are the greens though right a little bit smaller they tend to run a little bit faster than the seaside course because they're inland uh, they can afford to do so it's not nearly as exposed as the seaside course um, so they make the greens a little bit faster and they're a little bit more difficult, right? The seaside course has a little bit more glamour to it, right? It's a little bit more for the resort guests, right? The guys that are coming and trying to have fun playing around that want to have all that scenery behind them. The plantation course is more of like a traditional golf course, right? So it has this risk reward factor. You're going to have plenty of super low rounds, but the scoring average isn't drastically easier than the other golf course. And that's despite being a par 72. That's because when you get offline, and I wish we had the shot tracker data for it, there's a ton of penalty strokes to be had. I mean, there's a par three that's an island green that's extremely difficult. Actually, multiple of those island greens. Um, the par fours, there's a lot of water and play off the tee. I mean, if you have your stuff, you're shooting like 61. Like, I mean, you could shoot a 61, 11 under par around this track. That's possible. Uh, you're more than likely gonna shoot like six, seven under par. If you don't have your best stuff, though, you could shoot over par at the plantation course, and uh, that's really where you make or break your week, um, your week here. If you're shooting something like 7, 8 under par, you're going to be in contention by the end of the week. Uh, if you shoot over par, you're probably trunk slamming. Uh, making this, even though it's, you know, the quote-unquote side course, it's only in, in play for one of the rounds this week, maybe the most important round outside of Sunday. All right, now that we've talked about both golf courses, let's go through our key stats for analysis. And typically, I would break it down by the course. I did that last year. But what I realized, especially you know, looking back on the models this time around, is that they were extremely similar. The only real difference between the two is that driving distance, a lot more important at plantation than it is at the seaside. But because we're looking at a three to one, you know, ratio in terms of how much play is going on at seaside versus the plantation course it's not like it's overtaking our model so what we're going to focus on here are just in general the key stats that matter for this event um, which in terms of what we're looking at for our top three 
are the exact same for both golf courses. And at number one, we've got shots gained putting on Bermuda. That is our number one key stat at both tracks. You're dealing with easy to hit fairways, easy to hit greens, and you're looking at relatively low scores that are entirely driven and differentiated by how many putts that you make. I mean, when the field average is 75% for greens and regulation, I mean, what's that mean? The guys in contention are hitting 85 to 90% of the greens. At that point, it comes down to who makes the most amount of putts. And that's why John Rahm has never played the RSM Classic, probably never will, because he knows this is an effing putting contest. Uh, if I were to put it in his words. So it's our number one key stat. Shouldn't surprise anybody. They have extremely grainy Tiff Eagle Bermuda grass, which only furthers the advantage for those that have had a propensity on the Bermuda grass type of grass. Next up, we've got shots gained approach. Um, really looking at the wedge ranges though. So, you know, approach is typically an extremely correlated stat to success, um, extremely predictive from week to week. Those players that are you know, striping it with the irons tend to do so for at least a two to three week stretch. Um, but mostly looking at the 50 to 125 yard range. So that feel wedge, um, you're looking at a degreed club from 50 to 125 yards. And also that 125 to 150 range. If you saw the hole by hole breakdown for Seaside, almost almost every shot right on approach came from that range um, outside of the par threes. The par threes were 180 to, two, to 220. They were extremely difficult. Um, the par fives, obviously, if you're not laying up, you're going to be dealing with a much longer shot. But for a majority of the holes, you're looking at, you know, these wedge shots. So definitely something that I'm honing in on. Next up, we've got driving accuracy, and this is definitely a little bit more suited for the seaside than it is the plantation course. Um, completely wide open there at the plantation, but at seaside, if you're five to 10 yards offline, you can get into marshes or water hazards. And again, in 14 of the 15, uh, of the 18 holes, sorry, 14 of 18, uh, you're dealing with a water hazard of some sort. So um, definitely something I'm looking at because it is in play for three out of the four rounds. But if you're looking at showdown, trying to take players that are the best for plantation, probably not something to consider as much. In terms of other key stats, we're looking at shots gained at short courses. Um, that's identical for both tracks. Three putt avoidance with tricky, relatively fast link style greens. Um, that's also, you know, a similarity between the plantation and seaside. Um, good drive percentage, so keeping yourself in play. Um, that's more seaside heavy, like the driving accuracy. Um, better your better percentage. Um, that's important for both tracks, but especially plantation. Um, shots gained at coastal courses. Uh, well, we know that seaside. And uh, lastly, shots gained at comp courses, uh, which we'll get into right now. All right, and now for our comp courses. The tracks around the PGA Tour that should play similar to what we see for this week. So at number one, we've got Wailai Country Club, which is a coastal track on Hawaii, a Bermuda grass track, short positional, driving accuracy is important, wedges are important, shots gained putting on Bermuda. So why not make it a comp course? And if you take a look at correlations between leaderboards over the schedule, these two golf courses have among the highest coefficient of any courses on the PGA Tour. So uh, a lot of correlation there from the eye test, you know, logic, stat standpoint. It's checking all of the boxes that we're looking for. Um, that's the home of the Sony Open for anybody that's maybe new to PGA DFS. Um, so if you're looking at shots gained, course history, that sort of thing, um, I think you should look at Wiley and the Sony Open. A lot of the players that have had success around that track will also likely have success around this track. Next up, we've got Harbortown Golf Links, the home of the RBC Heritage, and another short positional track where you lay up off the tee a lot more than you're hitting driver. It's a relatively easy golf course. It's a more of a linksy style course. So I know, you know, obviously the seaside course has that links influence. It's the same story around the RBC Heritage. So you have the shaved off areas around the green. It's exposed to the wind. Um, they tend to be relatively short golf courses too. I mean, outside of Kiowa Island, which is an absolute bear up there in Carolina. But uh, yeah, Harbortown Golf Links, kind of similar to a Wailai. Um, you'd expect to see a lot of crossover between the leaderboards. And lastly, we've got Sedgefield Country Club, the home of the Wyndham Championship. It's also worth noting that the greens at RBC are also Bermuda and similar at the Wyndham Championship. So if you're looking at putting stats, I think there's a lot of crossover. You have to be super accurate off the tee around Sedgefield. So even more so, I'd say, than the courses in play this week. Um, there's a lot of trees in play, overhanging limbs. So the players that tend to be elite accuracy guys um, get a lot of uh, boost around Sedgefield Country Club. So that's 
that's why it's at number three. It's a little bit more off the tee heavy than uh, the first two golf courses uh, than what we're going to get for Sea Island this week, um, particularly because Plantation's a play, right? And pretty much driving accuracy is a given around that golf course. Uh, that's why Sedgefield's down there at number three. But a few other courses that don't have Shot Tracker that I'm considering for this week would be Port Royal Golf Club, the home of the Bermuda Championship, and then El Camillion, the home of the Mayakoba Classic, Worldwide Technologies uh, Championship at Mayakoba, if you want to go with that name. Both of those courses are overseas, international, so you don't have the Shot Tracker, but they're short positional. Mayakoba, My if you miss offline, you're in hazards, much like what you have at Seaside, whereas Port Royal, a little bit more reminiscent of what you get at Plantation. So I think that both of those, in terms of leaderboard crossover, might be worth a few looks. But unfortunately, you know, unlike the Sony Open, RBC Heritage, and the Wyndham Championship, uh, we do not have shot tracker or uh, shots gained data um, for any of those players. All right, fellas, that is all I've got for this course breakdown. Hopefully, you feel prepared for these courses. I mean, I know it's a little bit of a bear to have two tracks, but for those that are willing to get into it, really break it down piece by piece, I think you're going to see a huge advantage this week. You're going to have a lot of lazy analysts, a lot of lazy DFS players out there that go out there just try and punt this sort of week. I know it's one of the last true events that we have of this calendar year, so a few people probably already going into vacation mode. But for those of us that can stay, stay strong, you know, for much of these fall swing events, it's kind of just staying strong, staying true to your process, your research time, you're going to find those results. I mean, I told you last week, I had one of my best weeks of DFS of this calendar year. People in the community who had multiple GPP takedowns, right? It's the type of reward that you're going to get for doing this research. So for all of us DFS hardos out there, it's the time to go out there and take advantage. And uh, this week is no different than the last two months, which have just been an absolute goldmine for us out here. So uh, looking forward to the DFS breakdowns. We'll have those dropping throughout the week. Core picks our live stream on Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. as per usual. So make sure you are subscribed to the channel if you haven't already. That way you don't miss any of these course breakdowns going into the future, but also all of the DFS content I post. If you're an NFL fan, you watch football. I do some showdown previews, a few main slate videos from time to time covering NFL. Um, so make sure to check all of that out as well. So until next time, guys, best of luck. I appreciate you guys stopping by and enjoying the content. And uh, I'll catch you guys for next week's video.